Why were the ancients so interested in the motion of the stars? Why was cosmology sacred to the ancients? Pondering the history of ancient Egypt, we typically think of the mysteries of the pyramids and the grandeur of the temples. But where did it all start? Do we know how long ago the ancients began tracking the stars? Could there be lost worlds buried beneath the sands? Cosmology is the study of the universe in its totality. We think of cosmology as science, whereas the Egyptians considered it sacred. There's one thing we know about ancient Egypt for certainty, is that they observed the star Sirius. And we are sure when they speak of that star. Everything that comes out of the ancient world has to have a spiritual and metaphysical base. The ancients, and the ancient Egyptians in particular, but probably ancient civilizations more generally, saw themselves, humanity, us, as tied in with the bigger environment, the cosmos, the bigger picture. Uh, they built monuments and they aligned them. Uh, but what for? And do their belief systems uh, have validity today. If we want to decode Egyptian symbolism, we should look for clues in the ancient language that Hakim learned as a child from his elders, living along the Band of Peace. Looking at the many images left by the Egyptians, we have assumed that they were obsessed with death. Turning to the ancient Suf language, however, we learn that they didn't even have a word for death. They called it Westing. We have no word death in our culture. No word death. And uh, to express this operation of <laughs> death, we say Westing. Uh, you know, going towards west, like the sun rises from the east, and Westing. So well, there is no uh, word of death here. Well, they believe in resurrection. If the sun sets in the west, the resurrection happens in the next day when the sun rises in the next day. So the deceased believe that it's just like the sun. The Egyptians obviously had a very different worldview from ours today. They believed in the afterlife and the soul's immortality. Was it possible at all? that they had found some sort of science of immortality, for example, we call it. As crazy as it may seem, uh, they seem to be very, very convinced that they knew how to send the king to his cosmic world. Those stellar gods uh, of whom the king believed that he himself would become one stellar god after his death, constructed monuments and performed rituals that mimic the events that they saw in the sky. It sounds against all the tenets of our scientific beliefs, but we have to see why they were so convinced. The ancient Egyptians perceived the land as a cosmic environment, that it followed the activities of the sky because they believed them to be uh, running in parallel. And they had reasons to believe that. Uh, one of the main reasons was the cycles of the Nile. The Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt and it performed the cycle, which followed the cycle of the sun and the stars. 
uh, it's not surprising at all that they associated the, the reappearance of the stars with the rebirth of the life. Essentially, this, this star religion, if you like, boiled down to one important aspect, that it somehow could help the king become a spiritual being and return to the cosmic world in a specific place with Orion and, and so forth. How they thought they were going to do it is by looking very, very carefully at what happened to the stars. And the stars perform an annual cycle. But those of Sirius and Orion give us a curious cycle in that they disappear or they appear to disappear. But if you watch a star over the course of the year, you'll find that there comes a time when it is very low in the west at time of sunset. So the sun sets and as it gets dark, the star appears just for a few seconds over the west. If you come the next day, you will not see that star. And for 70 days or so, the star has gone. It seems to have gone under the earth. But after those 70 days, it appears by this time at dawn, rising just before the sun, which we call the heliacal rising, whereas the Egyptians call it the rebirth of the star. So in their mind, something happened. In their mind, the star went in the underworld, stayed in the underworld for 70 days, and then by magic, popped up again, was reborn again in the east. That's the pyramid text. The pyramid text mimic the site. At the ancient site of Saqqara, we find the pyramid texts, the oldest known religious texts in the world. Covering the inner walls of these small pyramids are thousands of hieroglyphs showing knowledge of celestial mechanics and cycles of time. Although we've come a long way in our understanding of hieroglyphs, it is possible that many layers of meaning in the symbols remain hidden until now. When we approach hieroglyphics, we do so from our own point of view, and we assume that the letters of our alphabet correspond with certain hieroglyphs. There are 4,000 Egyptian hieroglyphs but only 26 letters. In order to crack the code, we need to open our minds to different levels of meaning. I think it's just familiarity with the way modern languages work. No one expects that a word would work differently. Our, our mindset is that a letter is the carrier of a phonetic value and that a word is the carrier of a concept. To understand the Egyptian words, you have to start from the approach that the letter is the carrier of the concept, and the word is an extended sentence. There are nuances of meanings to the words um, that you don't get if you don't understand what the individual glyphs mean. Um, for instance, there's an Egyptian word that is translated as diving duck. But when you read the glyphs, it really reads pool of water, place of diving duck. In 1822, French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion and British scientist Thomas Young deciphered the hieroglyphics from the Rosetta Stone. The stone was created in 196 BC. It showed the same text in hieroglyphic, Greek and Demotic Egyptian on the one tablet. Scholars have used Champollion's translations as the basis for deciphering hieroglyphs. Could Champollion have missed subtleties or even withheld some information? One biographical study of Champollion said that he delayed for a very long period of time before producing his translation because in the words of the, the study, um, he clung stubbornly to the idea that an Egyptian glyph might mean something more than just a phonetic value. Laird Scranton is a computer software engineer who has interpreted a new aspect of hieroglyphics. 
His research is revolutionizing the way hieroglyphic is understood. Basically, Egyptian hieroglyphic words work more like an acronym in English, um, like the phrase FYI or an acronym such as CIA or CBS, where anyone who reads English understands that you don't try to pronounce this word. This is not a word that you're going to read for its meaning in terms of the letters all put together. It's one letter at a time, stands for one word at a time, and you put the words together to get the meaning. If we think of each hieroglyphic word as an acronym, rather than having a phonetic value, a new layer of interpretation appears. Hieroglyphs reveal in symbolic terms the way the ancient Egyptians thought the universe works. I can show that certain key glyph shapes came out of cosmology, which describes how the universe was created. Okay, and because the shapes came out of cosmology, it makes sense that the meanings that attach to the shape are associated with cosmology also. They would have meanings related to the creation of the universe. Once you agree that the sun glyph means what it means, and that's all traditional meanings, it's hard to argue that the word month doesn't say the moon makes an, an orbit. Or it's hard to argue that the word year doesn't say time of the Earth's orbit around the sun. The ancient Egyptians were almost obsessive keepers of records. And one thing that they observed most was the celestial objects. We'd expect them to pay attention and record. Now, how far back? That's a big question. Well, we now have some sites that go at least six or seven thousand years before. There's a megalithic site that has been found in the early 70s, uh, but not understood until lately, uh, that has astronomical alignments. And strangely, the astronomical alignments that it has are precisely the ones you find in the Pyramid Age. So Orion, Sirius, the summer solstices they're all there. It's no more theory. We have evidence that they did it. <laughs> For decades, author Robert Beauval has been studying the alignment of Egyptian monuments to key stars. Mohammed Shukla. We've come here, and what we're trying to do is get to the Naptha Plain. Yeah. The most important thing is we get there. Yeah. He is now planning an expedition across the desert to a site called Nabta Playa, 100 kilometers west of the Nile and 30 kilometers north of the Sudanese border. It is the location of Egypt's oldest astronomical measuring device. And when we're there, how do you know we're there? Uh, it's all desert. Yes, it's a desert. Every, every place here in Western desert, I know it. If you can, we're going to need a GPS. Yeah. If you can yeah. get one. Yes, I have one. That's, that, that makes me feel a lot happier. The team finds out that permits from Cairo have been delayed. Now we wait. You tell us we wait for yeah. the answer from Cairo. And so in the meanwhile, <clears throat> let's go and see the sites. Let's go and see some of the temples here, yeah? Okay. Let's do it. The key to decoding Egypt is in the alignments of the temples which changed in different epochs to match the majestic drift of the procession of the stars. We're now here at the Karnak Temple in Luxor. Uh, on this wall we can see the ritual of the stretching of the cord. On the right hand side is the goddess Seshet, represented by a priestess. She's holding a rod and a mallet. And on the other side is the pharaoh. There's a cord looping between them, and what they're doing is that they're aligning the monument to the stars. We know from inscriptions at the Temple of Karnak that they aligned monuments with the circumpolar stars, principally the Big Dipper. They also aligned to the stars of Orion. 
very similarly to what we also have at Nabka. The Karnak Temple, the very center of Egyptian religious activity, is aligned to the sunrise at the winter solstice. So as we look down the axis this way, on the winter solstice, the sun will rise along the axis. And in the summer solstice, it will be aligned to the sunset of the sun. So as we have at the Napta Playa, in the circle of the calendrical circle where there is the summer solstice alignment, here we have another example of this similar alignment 3,000 years later. On the expedition into the open desert, Robert Boval hopes to see for himself that these alignments exist in the remote region of Napta Playa. The team prepares by mapping a route they will access via GPS. Jeeps are equipped with supplies for the dangerous journey. The team arrives at the first stop on their journey through history. In the heart of the El Carga oasis lies a Christian settlement dating back to the 3rd century AD. Original paint graces the ceiling of the chapel, telling the stories of Adam and Eve. What is important here is that at Napta, we have a settlement that is 6,000 BC at least. And here we have a settlement, a Roman settlement, which is of the first, second century. Surely the people here were aware of some sort of origins in the, in the desert. They must have moved around here. We're only 300 kilometers away. And this is a big work that anthropologists have to get into, cultural anthropologists, people who understand how to look for clues within a lost culture. We're looking for a lost culture that could be the origins of our civilization. That's what we're talking about here. Off in the distance, the Christian settlement can be seen. In the valley below, we can see the old riverbed of the Nile, which has migrated over 60 kilometers to the east. How many thousands of years would it take to wind back the geological time clock to when the Nile flowed here? The Nile we know there was here. Before we didn't know. Do you realize what this is? Almost surely the ideas of these people, their beliefs, the way they look at the stars, the way they look at the sun, the way they buried people, comes from here to influence the, the pharaonic civilization. Imagine. Now imagine 2,000 years ago, uh, there was a Roman garrison with centurions walking about, and priests, and uh, Roman ladies in uh, carriages. I mean, it, it's amazing to think that this was like this. People have been here for thousands of years. I mean, we know that. But now you're going to show us caves, you're going to show us prehistoric caves, where there are drawings that tell us that people were here even longer than we thought. Maybe 10, maybe 15,000 years ago. And that's incredible. Now we're on a 30, 40 meter high dune, uh, right in the middle of the, the path of the road. The old road, as you can see, I mean, it's quite amazing. The old road actually strikes a dune. This is a new dune. It's been formed, what, in the last 30 years or so? It shows you how the sand moves fast. The team tests the jeeps in the open desert by heading off to an ancient desert monastery. Along the way, the team stumbles across a large outcropping of stone with obvious layers of stratification. The guide tells the team that the area is an ancient ocean bed. There's water like ripples. 
and seashells are still embedded in the hard rock, indicating a vast change in geology and climate over the past several thousand years. It's probably petrified timber, this, on a much la later period, but you can see the shells here. The shell is encrusted, They're millions of years old. We're walking on terrain that is millions of years old. The Western Desert today is rainless, but in the past, it received as much as 500 millimeters of precipitation per year. There were permanent lakes, large springs, and seasonal streams. The most recent wet period was between 130,000 and 70,000 years ago. Then it was thornbrush, savanna. At that time, the area supported many large animals, gazelles, giraffes, buffalo, camels, and antelopes. After that period, it was hyper-arid until 12 or 13,000 BC. Before 12,000 years ago, the summer tropical monsoons reached southern Egypt. Precipitation was limited and fell mostly during the summer months. It was sufficient to support small animals and cattle. The small animals could live off the dew. The climate resulted in highly mobile human populations. There are ancient cave paintings in a remote location that may provide clues to human settlements from the distant past. Is this crucial evidence being protected by Egyptian authorities? It's terrible. Terrible. It's priceless. It's priceless. Priceless prehistoric evidence. Look here. Look here. What's this, a dog or a gazelle? A man. You see the man here? He's wearing pharaonic clothes. It's terrible. It scribbles all over. I mean, the evidence that we're looking for is being destroyed by, by irresponsible people coming here. The site is unprotected. And the irony is that people who are responsible are prevented from coming here and driven crazy with licenses and papers. And... Look here. Oh, there's a beautiful Hattorian cow. Look at this. I mean, this, this, is, this is an artist. This is not a, a primitive uh, carver. Pre-dynastic Egyptian belief systems originated with cattle cults linked to the Nile. A cow was seen as the mother of the sun. Cattle were deified and were considered earthly representatives of the gods, an enduring ideology with Hathor as the center figure. Images of bulls were shown with depictions of stars, and this dates to before pre-dynastic Egypt. Cattle pastoralists were in the Sahara several thousand years before pre-dynastic Egypt. Gilf Kabir, which means large plateau, is another large ceremonial center a further 600 kilometers west, near the borders of Libya, the Sudan, and Egypt. The Cave of the Swimmers, made famous by the movie The English Patient, is located here. Prehistoric rock art shows people and their cattle. Since Gilf Kabir is 600 kilometers away, it seems as though cattle cults were prevalent throughout North Africa in ancient times. Could this be another clue that the nomadic tribes were connected? Could they have influenced the ancient Egyptians? Arriving at the monastery, we can see it has never been accessible by road. Once occupied by Christians, it lies upon an ancient camel trail 40 days from its closest neighboring site.
It still shows evidence of having been an oasis, with a huge acacia tree that is more than 800 years old. The team has a picnic on a carpet of yellow acacia flowers. This is a <coughs> wonderful oasis. I mean, you know, I'm really pleased. We tested the cars, everything is working fine. Yeah. You know, the drivers are fine. And uh, it, it was a good idea to come and rest here. It's, I needed the rest because after all this tense of waiting for the permits, everything is ready, the permits are ready. Everything. Yeah, but you must be to leaving now this place to go to the hotel and yeah. stay overnight. And we start tomorrow up early at 3 a.m. morning. I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm yes, ready. I know you're ready, but you don't know. It's a hard way, hard, hard way to arrive to Abusimbe. Let's do sure. it. Let's yeah. do it. We wait a long time. Let's do it. Let's have a good night's sleep. The team gets an early start, armed with long-awaited permits granted by the Supreme Council of Antiquities and the Egyptian army. They will enter the dangerous region of the Western Desert, to the south of El Carga Oasis. Well, after days of waiting and of uncertainty, we're finally on the road. We've got the permit, and we're ready to go out in the desert to, uh, to, uh, to Napta. After driving south for hours along an old road, covered by occasional sand dunes, there is nervousness in the air. The team will be traveling blind in the open desert for the last part of the journey, relying solely on GPS equipment to locate the ancient site of Nabta Playa. Yeah, I, I would, um, but this is very good, this is very tough. Three kilometers. Oh. I'm sure. What clues will be uncovered at Napta Playa? How have these influences drifted across the African continent? More than 3,000 kilometers further west, in Mali, there is a living culture with a surprisingly similar worldview to that of the ancient Egyptians. The Dogon live in Mali, largely in isolation. Studies of the Dogon culture mirror the ideology of the ancient Egyptians with uncanny precision. I realized through my Dogon studies that there were relationships between Dogon words and Egyptian words, and I noticed that Dogon drawings turned up as glyphs in those Egyptian words. Laird Scranton's radical reinterpretation of Egyptian hieroglyphs came directly from his studies of Dogon cosmological symbols. Their priests use cosmological drawings, symbols they have used for thousands of years. While it is impossible to ask the ancient Egyptians to explain their beliefs, Dogon priests can explain their cosmology and how their symbols are written and pronounced. The Dogon lay things out in such detail that it's like having the teacher's copy of the manual of the book you know you're studying with the, with the the answers to the questions written down in the back. 
You can go to a Dogen priest or you can go to the anthropological studies that were taken in relation to the Dogen priests and they flat out tell you what their symbol means and what they're, um, you know, what, what they're trying to talk about. The general pattern I, I could say is that Dogen cosmology tells us how a concept should be expressed, how the word should be pronounced, what multiple levels of meaning the word should be associated with, and what kind of a drawing it should be associated with. That predicts for us what we ought to find in Egypt. And so when I go to uh, Egyptian studies, I look at the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary or go to a book about Egyptian cosmology, sure enough, I find the same word expressing the same meanings written with the same drawing or the same drawn character, and I say I've got a match. How is it possible that the Dogon culture in present-day Mali is connected to the ancient Egyptians? What is the link? The Dogon seem to have come out of a class of priests who had very specialized knowledge and who, uh, for one reason or another, were not happy with the way things were going in Egypt and deliberately left. Um, I would say that sounds like it's true. I can't prove it's true, but it doesn't contradict anything I know. The fact that there's a match between the Dogen drawing and the Egyptian glyph in the context of the same word, pronounced the same way, with carrying the same meanings, is just another level of validation that I'm on the right track, that these words really do correspond to each other. Using this new interpretation of hieroglyphic, what can we learn about the ancient Egyptian view of sacred cosmology? I had some concerns um, originally as I began writing some of the books about what right did I have to be revealing secrets that have been kept for 3,000 years. But when I realized that the cosmology is about science, it's about um, the creation of matter and things like that, and I realized how close our science is right now to being um, caught up with what the, uh, the cosmology, the ancient cosmology seemed to know. I realized that if anybody's going to get any benefit out of it at all, that it has to come out now. You can't wait any longer. They're, we're only about 50 years away from discovering all the things that I found in the Dogen and, and Egyptian cosmology. Is it possible the ancient Egyptian cosmology was more advanced than today's science? I'd say there is information in the ancient cosmology that would be a benefit to the string theorists and to the, um, the co modern cosmologists if they'd pay attention to it. I think the Dogen and the Egyptians explained to us how it is that a mere act of perception can cause the wave-like behavior of matter to turn into particles, which science, the scientists don't know. When you ask uh, Stephen Hawking how many fundamental par particles there are, he says more than 200. If you ask a Dogen, Dogen priest, he says 266. Science is on the verge of understanding things that ancient civilizations seemed to know long ago. How is this possible? You're very, very close. Uh, within a couple of hundred meters. The excitement builds for the real destination of the expedition the ancient site of Napta Playa. Is that it? Yeah. Here we have this, this bunch of huge megaliths that were dragged from God knows where and placed in, in, in a pattern, uh, a sort of center point of the whole area. It's essential that we do not disturb the stones, we don't touch anything, we just look at them. 
because the alignments are there and they've been there for thousands of years, undisturbed, and we can use them to date this place. A group of archaeologists led by Fred Wendorf called the Combined Prehistoric Expedition by chance found some pottery shards at Napta Playa. They thought that the megaliths were just outcrops of rock. And then they started to realize, well, these are setting on top of playa sediments, you know, sediments that were built up during the Neolithic time. Uh, and so how did they get there? And so they, they had to get there from man. These were man-made objects, these megaliths. One of the possible links to Egypt before the pharaohs is that Napta Playa became climatically hyper-arid like it is today, around 3800 BC. It has not been lived at or used since. It has been assumed by historians that Egypt borrowed its complex society from Mesopotamia. However, it is now generally recognized that a process of social complexity is not diffused from one location to another, but rather develops locally. Thirty four hundred BC is when you see uh, pre dynastic cultures building up on the Nile Valley, just a hundred kilometers east of Napta Playa. If that's the case, then a lot of the great dynastic Egyptian stuff we're all familiar with had some aspect of origin in the Napta Playa people's cultural development. Dr. Nicole Dueck is an Egyptologist who lectures at the British Museum and at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. By strange coincidence, she happened to be at Napta Playa on the same day as our team. From what I understand from her, she also believes that this could be the source of Egyptian civilization. This is just amazing. I've wanted to come here since the first publications came out. Uh, what are the odds of meeting on the same day? None. Exactly. The coincidences for me are astonishing. I mean, last year, the same people, we went to Gilf Kebir and the Wenat. We spent two days roaming around Karkotal and looking at the graffiti and, you know, all the bovids and the cattle and the people moving around with their animals, and it's the same dates as here. These people had what today we would call a calendar. Uh, they, they, they used the position of the sun to mark the, the specific days of the year, and the, the main stations of the year, of course, are the summer sources, the winter sources, and the two equinoxes. No doubt, they tracked the sun through the year, and therefore they had a calendar. This structure may not appear significant above ground, Looking beneath the surface reveals an enigma. These complex structures are the most enigmatic remaining aspects of Napta Playa. When they excavated the central one, the largest one, underneath the surface, down in the Playa sediments, the Playa sediments are about 10 feet deep. They found this megalithic sculpture. Some people call it the cow stone. Uh, it has perhaps a vague resemblance to a cow, but it also seems maybe to have an astronomical meaning because it's in this astronomical complex. And then underneath the scope of the stone, on the bedrock, underneath all the sediments that were laid down earlier, they found another sculpture, sculpted out of the living bedrock, you know, sort of like the Sphinx is sculpted out of the bedrock. It's the bedrock sculpture was carved and sediment filled it in over thousands of years. Then the cow stone was carved and placed there, and then sediment filled it in again. We are looking at three subsurface layers of sediment. This is a clue to the extreme age of Napta Playa. What makes all this far more exciting is that they also align to stars. And that's a, a, a totally different ball game here because aligning to stars means that they track the seasons. The climatic conditions were very important to them. That was the beginning of the monsoons, and therefore the stars would be the signal to them that the monsoons had started. Uh, they would start migrating here, and they would arrive here when the water, the monsoons, the rainfalls had filled the lakes. It was essential that they get here when the lakes have water. It would have been a fatal mistake had they come here 20 or 30 days before the event. 
From the central complex radiates three series of lines, uh, east and a series of lines north. Mm -hmm. right. According to Wendorf and, uh, and, and the checkups by Brophy, we've got alignments to the, to the rising of certain stars yes. here yes. and here. A double alignment of blocks, 250 meters long, points to the brightest stars in the belt of Orion. The second line points to the rising position of Sirius. Another long line of stones aligns to the brightest star of the Big Dipper, which later Egyptians represented as a cow thigh or leg. The stele faced the circumpolar region of the heavens, which the pyramid texts describe as a place where the stars never die. They've got uh, Orion's belt and Sirius. What's interesting is that they seem to be tracking them, not just aligning two, but they seem to be tracking them over the movement over a long period of time. So they knew the stars moved, and they knew that the sun moved the same every year on an annual cycle. Maybe the whole ceremonial complex has something to do with the age of Gemini and transition to the age of Taurus. The constellation of Taurus is represented by a bull. If we are talking about the transition to the age of Taurus, was the symbolism of cows in ancient Egypt connected to the nomadic cattle cults prevalent in the area? So astronomy is telling us that there's a link. Now we need the anthropologists and the Egyptologists to find that link. The problem is that most of these disciplines are so entrenched in their own little world that it's very difficult to move people one side or the other. And I mean, I don't know how it is in the United States, but in Britain, everyone is in his own little world and people who deal with text won't talk to people who deal with sites in the same discipline. It's becoming more than obvious now. I think it is. That there are... There are connections. connections. Of course there are. And they're very, very important connections because there are no other answers, for the moment anyway. And this is as good as any. Yeah. Better.